Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and this morning we are beginning chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Subject is marriage and divorce. So I'm looking forward to listening to Chris on Wednesday night because we are in a spiritual battle, and that is very much where the battle takes place in the home and in the marriage. But that's the subject for chapter 10, and to sort of set the stage, remember from last week, the Lord gave a lesson on real greatness. What is it? Because those disciples, you remember, on their way back from Caesarea Philippi to Galilee, were arguing among themselves. Jesus was listening, but saying nothing until they got to the house, perhaps Peter's house in Capernaum, and he asked them, what were you discussing? And they remained quiet because they were embarrassed about the fact that they had been discussing the subject of greatness and claiming that each one of them was the greatest. I'm the greatest. No, no, I'm the greatest. And so he gave them a lesson on what real greatness is. You want to know what it is, he was saying? Service. Selfless service. Don't try to be first. Don't seek to be served. Seek to serve. Now, as I'll say when, we, when I expound the text, a lot of things happen in between the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter, or the, well, actually the, between verse 1 of chapter uh, uh, 10 within there. there. There are a lot of events that occur, and Mark has evidently edited these events, cut them down in order to, I think, give us an introduction to this subject of marriage and divorce by speaking of service, selfless service. That's an excellent way to introduce this subject because difficulties arise. How do we deal with them? Well, we deal with them by being humble and serving one another. So, they've come back from Caesarea Philippi. They've been in a house where Jesus has been giving them a lesson, and we read, getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered around him again, and according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether he, it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's pray. Thank you for that. It's a beautiful hymn by Martin Luther. And I would say if we can follow that prayer on the first line, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. And if we stay steadfast in his word, we will succeed in the lesson that the Lord gives here in Mark chapter 10. The psalmist asked, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a question for us because we are living in a day when the foundations are being shaken. There is distrust of institutions like government and business. That's not especially new. 
What is new and what is especially disturbing is people are asking, what is marriage? For millennia we knew, but now it is being re-examined and redefined in regard to its participants, its partners, and in regard to its permanence. Marriage vows like to honor and obey and till death do us part are being replaced with declarations like for as long as our love shall last and until our time together is over. That's not surprising. Permanence is scary. Till death do us part? That is scary. It requires commitment, which requires sacrifice, and we don't like to make that. So people are entering marriage with a weakened resolve. But that's not new. They were doing that in Jesus' day, finding every way they could to get out of marriage when it was inconvenient and, and justifying divorce from the Bible. This is the issue that Jesus teaches on in our passage in Mark 10. It was raised by the Pharisees. Jesus answered them by, in effect, asking, what is marriage? And he answers by quoting the Bible. The chapter begins with Jesus getting up from where he had been teaching the disciples about greatness and going from where they were in Galilee to a region beyond the Jordan. It was the region of Perea on the eastern side of the Jordan River. It was part of Judea, but that part of Judea was ruled by Herod. On the western side of the river, it was governed by Rome. Mark passes over a lot of events between Jesus getting up in the house where he had been teaching and crossing the Jordan. There was another mission of the disciples when the Lord sent out 70 of them. That's recorded in Luke chapter 10. He visited Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication or the Feast of Hanukkah. That's recorded in John chapter 10. The book of Mark really is different from, uh, from the first nine chapters. Chapter 10 on, you see a difference. Jesus is more open now about his Messiahship. He visited Jerusalem, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, during the Feast of Hanukkah, which is not covered here. But uh, he's more open about his Messiahship. There are no more cases of demon possession. We saw quite a bit of that in the earlier chapters of Mark. And there are no more episodes on the Sea of Galilee. Mark says that the Lord taught the people that gathered around him, but he mentions only one more miracle. And that takes place later in chapter 10 when Jesus heals Bartimaeus in Jericho. So there are differences between the first part of this book and what takes place from now on. One feature that hasn't changed is the opposition of the scribes and the Pharisees. They were always shadowing Jesus and trying to trip him up with questions. And our passage is no different. They came to him with a question about divorce. The Jews were divided over the reason or grounds for divorce. It was a subject of great debate among them and great de debate among their rabbis. Some justified divorce for the most trivial of reasons, Others limited it to the most serious offense. The dispute was over the interpretation of Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, which states that divorce is allowed when the husband finds something indecent in his wife. The difference of opinion among the rabbis had to do with explaining what Moses meant by indecent. People generally lined up behind the interpretation of two famous rabbis, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, who gave very different interpretations. Rabbi Shammai was uh, the conservative who took a 
very narrow interpretation, a strict interpretation of the law, and he taught that the indecent thing was immorality. That's the only ground for divorce. Hillel was the liberal, took a very broad explanation of what that was, that the husband could divorce his wife for almost any reason, from spoiling a meal to talking loudly. Rabbi Akiba, who came along sometime after those men, just a generation after the Apostle Paul, was a follower of Hillel. And he believed that a man could divorce his wife if he found another woman more attractive to him. Now that was how they explained indecent. And you can imagine which view was most popular, especially among the men. And it was a man's world. And divorce was not uncommon in it. It was an open scandal. So the subject comes up more than once in the Gospels because it was so common and the issue is so important. Jesus first spoke on it in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 31. But here, the Pharisees raised the question with him. And in Mark's editing of events, it comes after the Lord's lesson to the disciples on greatness, which, as we have said, he explained, he defined as humble service. In Matthew, it comes after a lesson the Lord taught on forgiveness. I think that's interesting. I think you can put those two together because I think that's a deliberate editing on the part of both of these gospel writers. Divorce would be reduced greatly if people would simply forgive their spouse or have the attitude of service toward him or her. I say simply. I know that's quite a challenge. We need the sovereign grace of God to do that. But where there's forgiveness where there is selfless service in a marriage, there's going to be a wholesome marriage. But these uh, men, these scribes and Pharisees, weren't concerned pastors who had come to Jesus seeking counsel on how to stem the flood of divorces in their synagogues. They were there to test Him. They were there to trap Him. This was a polarizing issue. And they knew that whatever answer he gave, he would fall out of favor with someone, with some group on one side or the other and draw a lot of criticism. And remember, this was Herod's domain. This was the region that he ruled where John the Baptist had lost his head for challenging the king's divorce and remarriage. And they very likely were hoping to bring about the same fate On Jesus. So they asked him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. In Matthew, the question is is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Well, the Lord knew their intentions, He knew what they were up to. He didn't take the bait and get embroiled in a debate over the opinions of the rabbis. Instead, he answered them with a question of his own. What did Moses command you? That's where you're going to find the answer to your question. You don't need to come to me. What did Moses command you? In other words, what do the Scriptures say? I don't think we can ask a more important question when we're discussing the issues of the day. What do the Scriptures say? Because that's where we get the answer. That's our authority just as it was their authority. Well, they knew what the Scripture said. They quoted Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, in answer to his question, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away, which they took to mean Moses sanctioned divorce. And it's true that Moses required that a certificate be given to the woman upon divorce, but... That wasn't because Moses approved of divorce. It was to protect the woman. It established that she was actually divorced and her former husband had no legal claim on her and that she was free to marry. The certificate 
would guard her reputation. But the Lord saw from their question that these Pharisees interpreted this certificate, this document that was to be given as the main emphasis of Moses, and it meant that he permitted divorce for any reason. So Jesus corrected them in verse 5. Moses didn't advocate divorce. He gave the commandment because of the hardness of their heart. He accommodated their weakness. This, as someone said, was not the highest moral standard that Israel could have been given. It was the best that Israel was fit to receive. I think that explains it quite well. This is what they were fit to receive because they were people with hardened hearts. They were self-centered. So Moses made this concession for the sake of the wife to protect her from a husband who might dismiss her from any and every reason. But the Pharisees were more interested in the certificate Moses gave that dissolved marriage than they were in the institution of marriage that God had established. So, Jesus directed them to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and to the origin of marriage to ask them, what is marriage? From the beginning of creation, he said, God made them male and female. That addresses a contemporary issue. The two are opposites, male and female. God created them to correspond to each other and to complete each other and for an intimate bodily and spiritual union. Verse 7. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. God created the institution of marriage. He created it for union, not disunion. He created it for union, not separation. This quote from Genesis 2, verse 24, established that in a very forceful way. The, the complete statement in Genesis is, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife or united to his wife, or as the King James, King, King James Version translated, cleave unto his wife. That is God's design. The man was to leave and cleave. And that word cleave in Hebrew, the word devak, is a strong word. And you get a sense of that from the modern Hebrew, which has taken that word and used it for the modern word for glue. So I don't think it's a stretch to translate the verse, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be glued to his wife. The idea isn't they're stuck with each other. The idea is they are stuck together. They are, they are held firmly together. That's the idea. Marriage was designed as a permanent union. That's clearly the idea from the result that Moses gives of the cleaving, of the uniting. The two become one flesh. Now, that doesn't mean that the man and woman lose their individuality, lose their identity. Uh, th they don't at all. They, they are still responsible individuals before the Lord God. They have different responsibilities within the, the, the marriage. They have individual responsibilities as believer priests before the Lord God. God has given to each of them a gift and they're to use that in His service. They're still individuals and they still have responsibilities, but they are to function together according to their responsibilities, according to their gifts, as a unit, not separately. But again, the, the, the point is this union is intended by God to be permanent so that the two are separated only by death. But... That's not only implied by these words and statements and the fact that God created the institution 
of marriage. It's explicitly stated here in verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, Jesus said, let no man separate. Well, the the Pharisees were ready to do just that, separate, because they had elevated the divorce certificate to a divine institution and devalued the importance of marriage, the actual divine institution. These were men of the law. These were men who said acceptance with God only comes through complete obedience to the law of Moses. They were men who said righteousness is works oriented, works produced. They were legalists. And one of the characteristics of legalism is to find loopholes in the law. uh, Excuses that they can can use to escape the hard, in fact, the impossible demands of the law. No one can keep the law. But if you're going to live according to the law, and if your righteousness and your acceptance with God is going to be law-based, then you've got to find ways to explain your failures and make things manageable. And so they find loopholes. And what we see here is that with this certificate and their interpretation of it. What the Lord confirms is divorce is abnormal. It's not according to God's design for marriage. It was allowed as a concession to human weakness. Worse things might have happened to spouses, to women, had it not been allowed. But it is a violation of God's design for marriage, which is, again, permanent. What are the grounds for divorce? The Pharisees were asking, hoping that the Lord would entangle himself in a self-incriminating debate. And he answered, let no man put asunder. Marriage is not a man-made institution or a contract of temporary convenience. It is God's institution. Divorce is putting asunder what God joined together. Literally, this word joined together is yoked together, which, again, it's another word that shows the permanence of the relationship, but it also shows the nature of the marriage relationship the intention of it. The husband and wife are a team. They are yoked together. They work together. Marriage doesn't function according to God's design when when one person lords it over another. When a husband lords it over the woman, gives her no freedom to develop, or the wife rebels against his rule. Proverbs 31 is very helpful, I think, in this regard. It's an amazing picture of a woman. Maybe the ideal, it's hard to imagine one woman being able to do all of that, one person being able to do all of that. But what it shows is, here's a woman who's blessed by her husband because she's very active, she's self-motivated, she accomplishes much in business and in mercy, in helping people, in helping her family. That's something of the ideal there. And that's something that a husband should relish, should encourage. It can only help him and the marriage relationship when she's able to to fulfill her calling in life. And we all have different callings to some degree. And the wife is to encourage the husband's calling and his gifts and the use of them in life and in his service to the Lord. And the husband is to do the same with the wife. They pull together. They are yoked together. They pull together. They plan together. They pray together. There is no more fundamental and important work than that of a couple in marriage. They fulfill God's command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. They have the fundamental task of training their children for life and most importantly, for the kingdom of God, of leading them to Christ and building them up in the faith. That's the Proverbs. 
which give the chief responsibility to fathers in giving instruction to children. They're to be the leaders of the home. They're to be the ones that instruct. But mothers also share in that responsibility. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. So there they are, yoked together. Proverbs 1, verse 8. You can think of various examples of, of godly mothers who did just that. Uh, the thought that came to my mind, or the person that came to my mind, was John Newton's mother. John Newton, as a young boy, went off to sea and lived as a reprobate and a life that seemed to show no grounding in the Word of God, and yet the reality was, before that, as a little boy, his mother taught him the Bible, had him memorize great passages of Scripture, many passages of Scripture, and, and, and those Scriptures which were hidden in his heart came out at the right time in a storm at sea, and it was that that God used to convert him and make him a completely different man. His mother is to be attributed with that great work in his life. But divorce destroys that and destroys the family, which affects the children profoundly. And I could spend time on that. There are studies that have been made that show how children fare far better in a home without divorce. But even when children aren't involved, and some couples can't have children, marriage is valuable in itself. The husband and wife are a complementary relationship. It, it completes each one in that union, in that couple. It is God-ordained and it is fulfilling. It's fulfilling in life as a whole, but it is especially spiritually fulfilling. Together as one, they are better able to worship and serve God. So when... A person separates that which God joined together, yokes together as a team. When that's disrupted, when that's dissolved, when that's separated, he or she defies God. Now that ended the discussion with the Pharisees, but it didn't end the discussion. The Lord went in a house with his disciples and the discussion continued with them. They had questions for him. This raised all kinds of questions in their mind. They were, they were taken back by the Lord's explanation of real greatness, and now they're taken back by His explanation of marriage and the permanence of it. They were so disturbed that in Matthew's account, Mark doesn't give us this, but in Matthew's account they said, if, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. It seems to indicate that they were followers of Rabbi Hillel and uh, wanted easy divorce. That tells us a lot about the disciples. I, I couldn't help, but I didn't want to get off on this too much, but I was reading over this and it occurred to me, they're, they're upset because they can't divorce their wives. These are men, remember, they're simple Galilean peasants who are arguing with each other about who's the greatest which is laughable. And here they are, very disturbed that they don't have a freeness about dissolving marriages. These are the people that Jesus Christ chose, which I think reflects a lot about election and the kind of people he picks. He doesn't pick many noble, many mighty, many knowledgeable, many wise. He picks people like this and changes them. And he would change them just as he's changed us. But this is what concerned them. If it's this way, Lord, it's better not to marry. So they wanted clarification. And Jesus was straightforward. A man who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against his wife. Divorce is that serious. It's the same with the wife. We, in the passage in verse 12, and if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Wives divorcing, husband were, divorcing their husbands was so rare among the Jews that no, no provision was made for it in the law. 
But a woman might desert her husband to marry another man. We had an example of that earlier in the book of Mark. Herodias did that when she deserted her husband Philip to marry his brother Herod. This is what John the Baptist exposed as an adulterous relationship back in chapter 6. Among the Greeks and Romans, it was not uncommon for wives to divorce their husbands. Mark wrote his gospel to the Romans. And that may have been stated here in verse 12. That may have been included for them. So, in this simple, straightforward way, the Lord refutes the rabbis and their interpretation of the law to uphold the sacredness of marriage and the permanence of it. What's missing from Mark's account is included in Matthew's, which is the exception to this, or what's sometimes called the exception clause. In Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus said, Whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So Rabbi Shammai was more right than Rabbi Hillel. The basis for divorce is narrow. If a man divorces a faithful wife and then adds to his sin by marrying another woman, he is guilty of adultery. Immorality is the exception. It is a violation of the sacred covenant of marriage. It, in effect, breaks the covenant. Divorce simply confirms that the covenant has been dissolved. Now Paul gives a second reason for divorce, and that is desertion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 15, he says, If the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Not under bondage suggests not bound in marriage. And of course, what else can a person do? If a spouse abandons the marriage, the, the innocent party can't prevent that. But he or she is no longer bound to that person if the person leaves, deserts the marriage. These are the legal grounds for divorce in the Scriptures. And I might add to that, nowhere do we read from the Lord or the Apostle a command to get a divorce if one of these occurs. If there's infidelity in the relationship, we're not commanded to divorce the other person, but it's permitted. So there are two grounds for divorce, adultery and desertion. Incompatibility is not a basis for divorce. Even the best of marriages, even in in such marriages as that, there is some incompatibility. And there's going to be friction in the best of marriages. In the best of circumstances, marriage is a union of sinners. And life in close quarters brings that out. Still, marriage is not a temporary alliance. It is not for as long as love lasts. It is pledged to permanence. It's the most serious human relationship there is. The disciples' response recognized that. It's better not to marry. No, it's better to marry. It's not good for a man to be alone. That's what God said. He looked on the situation. This is not complete. His solution to man being alone was creating Eve. The solution is marriage. It is His institution. He established it. He established it, therefore it is good. He pronounces it good. It is the most fulfilling relationship there is. But it is also a sanctifying relationship. In fact, that's one reason it's the most fulfilling relationship. It exposes our failures, our selfishness, and it it forces us to deal with that. If we're going to succeed in marriage, we're going to have to deal with the problems we have within ourselves. We're going to have to deal with our inconsistencies. And so it, it forces us to change and be selfless. That's good. And that really is the only way a marriage between two self-centered people and 
Every one of us qualifies on that. We are all born with egos and we are all born self-centered and self-serving. That's human nature in a fallen world. But the only way for people like that to succeed in marriage, only way for such a marriage to survive, and not just survive, but thrive, is by being selfless and forgiving. Or forgiving and serving. So it's not by accident that Mark edited these events as he did, moving from the Lord's instruction on real greatness as service to the subject of marriage. Marriage thrives as every relationship does when people seek to serve rather than seek to be served. And our model in that is Christ Himself, the servant who gave His life for us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. The disciples were slow to learn that. We all are. Still, there is some merit to their concern. Marriage is serious. No one should rush into it. People need to to choose wisely who they want to spend the rest of their lives with. And Christians must always marry in the Lord. Paul tells us that. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. Scripture warns against bad marriages. It's better to live in a corner of the roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Proverbs 25, verse 24. And we could teach it the opposite way as well. In fact, it's even truer for a wife with a difficult man. One of the old Puritans said, marriage is both honorable and honorable. And bad ones are particularly honorable or burdensome. So marriage requires wisdom. It's not to be entered lightly. And it requires commitment. It requires devotion and selflessness. It, it is a permanent relationship. That's the point of emphasis here in Mark. That's the ideal. But we live in a fallen world of broken ideals of broken lives and broken marriages, even in the church, even among God's people. So the question is, is there restoration? Can there be remarriage? And the answer is yes to both. When divorce is biblically based due to immorality or desertion, remarriage is legitimate for the um, innocent party and doesn't constitute adultery. Well, what about when that's not the case and people are improperly divorced? That often happens before people become Christians. It even happens to people who are born again. What then? John Murray, the late professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary, wrote a book a number of years ago, really about 60 years ago, simply titled Divorce. And he deals with all of these issues in these passages. And then he, at the end of the book, deals with all kinds of different circumstances. And deals with them quite thoroughly, I think. And James Boyce also had some good counsel on this question. Divorce and remarriage, illegitimately done, are bad, but not unforgivable. And God, he said, is always willing to begin again with us wherever we are or whatever we have done. Where there is repentance, there's restoration. Christianity is about forgiveness and rebuilding. So the church should never be closed to people and should always show mercy. That's what Christians should show to one another. Should show to the world for that matter. And and this is what the world should see in the church. The the world is in a, a desperate need for the light of God's grace. And that grace and that light seen in God's people. In an age 
when the, the nature and sanctity of marriage is being questioned and redefined, there will be a lot of direct as well as collateral damage. And that's inevitable. And it's going to ripple down through the generations. Man cannot defy God's institutions unscathed. Do not be mocked. Do not mock God. As a man sows, so, so shall he reap. Men rebel to their own ultimate harm and destruction. But the chaos and the darkness are an opportunity for the church to shine the light of God's grace. And the first place where the light should be seen is in Christian marriage. It is the picture that God has given to the world of the relationship between Christ and the church. If, if we neglect our marriages, we will have no witness to a dying world. We need to understand that God's plan for marriage is between a man and a woman, and it is a permanent union. We need to be dedicated to that against all of the the strong influences, and they are strong influences of the flesh in the world. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, the answer is the righteous can continue being righteous and be a witness. That is God's will. That's God's will for us. I think it's significant that the Old Testament, at least our version of it, begins with Genesis, where God establishes marriage, and it ends with Malachi, where God says, I hate divorce. God is the one who ends a marriage. Martin Luther said that. I'm reading a book titled Luther, Letters of Spiritual Counsel. And it's a collection of the letters that he wrote. It's been edited, but many of the letters that he wrote over the 30-some years of his ministry. And he wrote letters to a number of people, friends and acquaintances in Germany, who were dealing with various issues. And so it divides according to those issues, sickness and um, people who are dying. He wrote letters to them to encourage them. Another was bereavement, people who lost a loved one, he wrote letters to them to encourage them, and a variety of different issues like that. Well, in one um, uh, part of this book, which not, wasn't a letter, it was taken from the table talk that Luther had with his students and friends where he would they'd share a meal and he would speak, and these students would record the things that he that he wrote, or that he, that he said. And one of these, he, he speaks of uh, a very good friend who had, he consoled, who, whose wife had died in childbirth, which is not uncommon then. She got up at five in the morning, healthy, and at seven o'clock, died giving birth. Luther commented, alas, it must be painful for a loving couple to be separated in this way. But before that, he said, Our God is the greatest breaker of marriages. He joins people together and then separates them. This morning, she slept with her husband, and tonight she sleeps with our Lord God. How fleeting is our life. And that is so true. Life is fleeting. So we who are married must be committed to our marriages daily, daily. Look to the Lord God for grace to do that. That is a ministry. That is a ministry that the world needs to see. And you who are married have no greater marriage and rather no greater ministry than that. And so remember, life is fleeting. And you have this opportunity to shine forth the grace of God in your marriage. Now, I'm speaking here to Christians, but if you're here without Christ, if you've not believed in Him, that is your greatest need. Look to Christ. 
He died for sinners and He saves everyone who looks to Him. Everyone who simply believes in Him. Who understands that they're a sinner, they need a Savior. And the Savior is the eternal Son of God who became a man in order to suffer on the cross and bear in their place the penalty of their sin. He or she who trusts in Him, who attaches himself or herself through faith to Jesus Christ, receives all of that at the moment of faith. Receives the righteousness of Christ. So look to Him. Because when we believe in Him, He weds Himself to us and promises never to leave or forsake us. Now that should motivate us to live for Him and reflect His grace in all of our relationships. May God help us to do that. Why don't we stand and sing number 11 in the Songs of Praise book, A Debtor to Mercy Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 11. Father, what a great truth it is, a reality it is, that um, nothing can sever our soul from Your love. And we're always and forever secure. You don't forsake us. You don't abandon or divorce us. We are certainly debtors to mercy alone. We give you praise and thanks for that. Make us grateful. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.